Howdy, gang, and welcome once again to the Duct Tape Studios. I'm Jeff McAleer, your host here at the Gaming Gang channel. Thanks for joining me once again. Today, I am going to dive on in for a first look and page through of Forbidden Lands, the Blood March from Free League Publishing. This is written by Eric Grunstrom with additional writing from Per Holstrom with artwork provided by Henrik Rosenborg and Nicholas Brandt. The 256-page hardcover is available now, carries an MSRP of $39.99, or you can grab just the PDF over at Drive-Thru RPG for $19.99. All that said, let's swing on over to the other camera because here I've got the Blood March. A couple of things I do want to mention before we jump on in. First of all, the fine folks over at Free League Publishing were kind enough to provide me with this review copy, but neither I nor anyone else affiliated with the gaming gang has received any other sort of compensation for me to share this coverage with you. These days, it's important that you know that. We're also not going to look at each and every page of this adventure campaign, but I do want to give you a good feel for what's in the Blood March. I know nothing about this. I have not cracked this open. When I do first looks, it really is probably newer to me than it is to you. <laughs> but this is a campaign. So if you're a player hoping that your game master is going to pick up the Blood March, I would probably recommend tuning out now. Even though I don't know anything about this campaign, we're probably going to stumble across some things as I page through that are going to probably spoil some surprises of the adventures within. So just so you know, even though I don't know anything about the campaign, there could be some spoilers ahead. Of course, having said that, if your game master is considering picking up the Blood March, you might want to let them know about this video so they get a much better look at this book. So let's take a look at the back here. The plains of the Blood March once blossomed so abundantly that hot days would see rivers of nectar flow through the vales. The mountains yielded ore so pure that shards of unforged iron could be used for axes. Of course, this was before the demon flood. Ever since the sorcerer Zygafer had his demonic hordes lay waste to the country, the land has been dead and deserted apart from the twisted nightmares that now roam its plains and forests. Yet there should be much treasure to find for those brave enough to face their fears. The Blood March is an epic campaign module for the Forbidden Lands retro fantasy survival role-playing game. It's kind of funny how they present it that way. To me, this is kind of an old-school Renaissance-flavored fantasy role-playing game, but they say retro fantasy survival... Describing the demon-infested lands west of Ravenland. And then it tells us the contents. And it says, to make full use of this book, we recommend the Blood March map and cards pack sold separately. Got to admit, I did not receive the map and card pack, so we won't be taking a look at that today. So let's jump on in. So here we've got a map of the Blood March. And a breakdown here. Now, a few things I do want to mention, especially if you're not overly familiar with Forbidden Lands. For one, it was one of my favorite games the year it was released. I really, really dig Forbidden Lands because it's got an old school vibe to it, but it does utilize um, kind of an, an adapted Mutineer Zero engine system, or as a lot of people refer to it as just the year zero engine. And it's one of these role-playing games where combat's very lethal. Your characters are rather squishy. It's one of the reasons why it says it's a retro fantasy survival game, because you're not going to find your, even after multiple adventures, your characters aren't going to be these superheroes that are nearly demigods. No, they, they're, they'll become more powerful, but there isn't that, you know, insane, just 
power creep that you see in a lot of fantasy role-playing games. So it looked like we started off with a little bit of fiction. So we have the introduction here. The Blood March is Ravenland's neighbor to the west, known for its barren plains and proud riders who worship the holy volcano known as Horn. In Ravenland, the country is often referred to as the Ashen Vale, which is really just the eastern region. The only known passageway between the countries is through Shadow Gate Pass in the Thinder Range. Well, come on, you know, it's me. I mispronounce fictional people, places, and things all the time. It says, this book is chronologically set after the campaign Raven's Purge, which took place in Ravenland. Some of the events described here began there, but it is not necessary to have played Raven's Purge for the campaign Legacy of Horn, which is included in this book. If the gaming group intends to play Raven's Purge at some point, it would be best to do so before embarking on the Blood March. Got to point out, I don't have every release for Forbidden Lands. There's a, I think it's a couple of books that I do not have, which is actually kind of unusual because for the most part, Free League Publishing is always trying to send me just about everything that they release for me to share coverage with you of them. But I do not have Raven's Purge. I do have to point that out. So we're going to get an overview of the campaign. And as you can see, we have line artwork throughout. There's no color art in the Forbidden Lands books as far as I understand. I haven't seen any. But the line artwork is excellent. The Blood March is a campaign module for the Forbidden Lands role-playing game. Here you'll find descriptions of the Blood March region and its peoples, creatures, and terrain. Key players are introduced along with their disagreements and respective interests. Some of this is presented in the accompanying campaign Legacy of Horn, where the adventurers go searching for a set of holy weapons. The campaign can be played in a variety of ways, each with a different focus. The adventurers can ally with or support either of the key players, oppose them, or simply ignore them. The campaign brings the adventurers to various parts of the Blood March and can be interspersed with side quests, if so desired. So one interesting aspect of Forbidden Lands is that your Blood March isn't going to be the same as my Blood March because the maps aren't set in stone why there was mention of the map pack and in the core set you do have the the map and then you've got different locations you've got these adventure locations which i'm sure we'll see in this book as well and you also have stickers for them and they can be practically anywhere on the map and it's really interesting how the game master and the players develop the world as they explore. It's just kind of taking a peek at some of these. So it looks like here we've got the different cultures in the Blood March. So we've got the Vazians and the Ravenlanders and Alderlanders. They're humans. The elves. So we've got red elves and Ravenlander elves, half elves and moon elves. Got the dwarves. Orcs, Wolfkin, yes, we have Wolfkin in Forbidden Lands, just like we have Wolfkin in Dragonbane, which if you are interested in the new fantasy role-playing game, Dragonbane from Free League Publishing, I just reviewed it, so go check that out. Then we got Halflings and Goblins, and then it looks like we're going to get a breakdown, some information about different regions. Different regions in the Blood March. We've got some new spells. It says all spells from the player's handbook in the base game are found in the Blood March as well. In addition, there are three new schools of magic. Magma Song, as practiced by the country's priests of Hon. Mentalism, as practiced by the moon elves of the Blood March. And one Iromancy as it is taught by the followers of the Dreamstress. Very cool. So yes, there we go. We've got new spells. And as you can see, one of the things about 
Forbidden Lands I really like is how much information is very concisely presented. So as a game master with tons of information just rattling around in your head, it's nice to have just short, concise information for you for spells and monsters, NPCs. You're going to see the uh, stat blocks are not real large for NPCs and creatures and things like that. So it looks like we've got some new spells. You may have noticed that the size of this book is about the size of a traditional hardcover book. In fact, here's the player's handbook from the box set. And this is just a little bit larger than this book. And I think this is supposed to be the same height as the box from the box set. Uh, I do have the Book of Beasts, which I'll be looking at very shortly. And it does have kind of the same kind of cover style as the two core books that are in the box set. And there's actually room enough, it, it looks like, to fit that Book of Beasts into that box as well. So here we've got the different schools and their spells. We've got Journeys in the Blood March. So we've got some new terrain types. We'll probably have some uh, encounters or mishaps. I remember we had mishaps in one of the campaign books. Here we go, right there. Mishaps in Firelands, mishaps in the Crimson Forest. There is also a uh, D66, which is kind of funny because I'm not used to seeing that in role-playing games. I've seen it in board games and stuff, especially like sports games. So you take two six-sided dice, two different colors. One is the tens, the other is the single digits. You roll those and you get a result from 11 to 66. That is utilized in Forbidden Lands. So now we get Adventure Sites. Uh, no, I guess not yet. Artifacts. So we should have some new magic items. Yes. Helm of Horn. Sella's Dragon Boot. The Stone Crest of Horn. Wither Beam. This artwork is really, really nice throughout this. And I think these are gonna be our major players. Just take a look here. Yep, key players, there we go. Several key players in Legacy of Horn want to get their hands on one or more of Horn's Astra, an ancient set of magical weapons said to have belonged to Sela the Liberator, known among the Vaznians as Sela the Butcher. The key players all have their own intentions, but will likely form alliances with each other over the course of the campaign if it benefits them. Several of the key players behave discreetly and prefer not to reveal their true identities or agendas to strangers. At the same time, many of them need all the help they can get. So we're going to get a breakdown of them. So we get a legend, appearance, overt goals, secret goals, their uh, relations with other key players. Oh, and then it looks like we get a little bit of a, a table here that kind of gives us highlights there. So quite a few key NPCs, key factions. The Dreamstress. The Dreamstress is a giant demon of philosophical disposition who founded, oh, when I romancy, dream magic. She has built a beautiful temple with a dream tower in Oxengelder, whose pupils of different kin come to learn when I romancy. The Dreamstress Temple is one of the most peaceful and revered sites in Asleen, perhaps the one place its people are truly proud of. Wow, nice. All right, so we're going to get a bestiary with some new creatures. And as I mentioned, the stat blocks are pretty small. So here, now some of the more powerful monsters in Forbidden Lands will have different kinds of attacks. 
and you'll have uh, a table here, like right here for the phrase. We have uh, six different attacks. And as the game master, you're gonna roll to see what attack they use. Now that's not all of the creatures. There, we got a lot of creatures that, that just, you know, fight melee or fight ranged combat. So here we've got the Mecha. The Dwarven Mastersmiths of Firestead constructed Mechas to perform heavy tasks that did not require more than simple instructions. Some Mechas are still in working order in Trebolia and probably in other parts of Firestead as well. Mechas resemble dwarves in size and proportion, but are purely mechanical. Built of bronze, steel, leather, and other materials, optical crystals for eyes, and hydraulic mechanisms for muscles. The spring that drives them must be wound up every 12 hours with a key or some other tool that fits into the hole in the back. The mechas can be equipped with weapons and instructed to use them, but the ones in Tribolia have nothing but hand drills and fists to fight with, should they be ordered to. Only dwarven mastersmiths like Kogler can give them instructions, since doing so requires precise tinkering with the mechanisms hidden behind the hatch in the mecha's back. That's kind of cool. That is one of the other things about Forbidden Lands that I find to be really, really interesting is how unique a lot of the creatures are. Uh, this, it's, this isn't just kind of the same old, same old, like, European fantasy role-playing that we're used to. This tends to be a little bit more of a, um, I'd say magic light sort of setting. Not all characters have access to magic. So something else that's always very interesting are the random encounters. Because as I pointed out before, the map is not set in stone. So a lot of times random encounters drive a lot of the action. So as an example, we've got the dead foal. Up ahead, you see a scrawny animal, perhaps a deer, wandering around alone and afraid. It is behaving strangely and seems lost. Now and then it raises its head and lets out a hoarse, pitiful cry and then seems to listen for a response. You soon notice a group of jackals prowling nearby, probably eyeing the animal as their next meal. Then you realize the lone animal is the undead skeleton of a horse, probably the remains of a foal, and the jackals are drawing near. The Flying Horse, the Inglorious Butchers. Rust, the dwarf in the stone. You happen to come upon a monolith and notice that the veining of the stone resembles a dwarf looking out with its hands pressed against the surface. At the foot of the stone, there are some half-wilted flowers next to a tankard of ale in which two slugs have drowned. <laughs> it might be a tombstone. That's pretty wild. And then we get into our adventure location. So we get these various different locations. A lot of times they're towns. So here, type of adventure site, it's a settlement. We got a background about that. How do you get there? Events that take place there. Uh, we usually have a keyed map that'll show us important locations. So we've got the legend, there's our locations. There's our overall map that we get the keyed map as you can see here. And there's our events. So this is pretty much laid out like other adventure books for Forbidden Lands. Because there, there is a, a real sandbox feel to the, uh, even with a campaign, there's still a, a very sandboxy element to the adventuring. And even though the map isn't necessarily a hex map, there is a bit of a hex crawl feel to the proceedings as well. So here we've got just more of these locations. So as an example, we have Watch of the Sisters. 
The Watch of the Sisters is the name of a very old temple in the Blood March dedicated to the Divine Sisters Whale and Flow, the respective goddesses of winds and flowing fresh water. The forgotten story of the temple is that horse folk from the drawn lands in the west once rode into Aslin on a mission from the sister gods to seek a union with the local population, the Vasnians, so that their peoples could trade with one another. Instead, the writers started a war of expulsion and extermination because their proud chieftain Sela felt slighted at the meeting. Will was so enraged by Sela's arrogance that she whipped up hurricanes on the plains between the two countries so that no one has since been able to return to the drawn lands from Aslin. The proud Sela responded by renouncing his old goddesses and encouraged by the Aslin dwarves, urged his brethren to worship Horn, the largest volcano in the land. And we get some important people in the settlement. Once again, the legend, the locations, events. Yep, there we go. Looks like that might be how we wrap up is with the various different adventure locations. Now we get the aftermath. So the situation after the finale. And then it looks as if these might be handouts for each of the key players. Kind of looks like that might be it. There's quite a few of them. All right, and then we finish up with an index. And that is what we find when we take a look inside Forbidden Lands, the Blood March from Free League Publishing. Once again, this is available now. You can pick up the hardcover for an MSRP of $39.99, or you can grab just the PDF alone over at Drive Through RPG for $19.99. So, of course, I will have a review of the Blood March in the very near future. Also, as I pointed out in the next few days, I will have a first look at Forbidden Lands Book of Beasts, which is a new bestiary for Forbidden Lands. So stay tuned for that as well. All right, that is it for this time out. If you like the video, by all means, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel if you haven't already. And if you do subscribe, don't forget ring that bell because it'll not only let you know when I upload videos such as this first look, it'll also inform you when my live stream, the Gaming Gang Dispatch, airs Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. Central right here on YouTube. Of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for our latest in tabletop gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more that you won't find here on the YouTube channel. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Once again, I'm Jeff McAleer. Thank you very much for taking time out to watch this video. And until I see you next time, here's hoping each and every one of you gets to enjoy plenty of great gaming with your gang. Thank you.